Silas Marner by George Eliot. They might be seen in districts far away, among the lanes or deep in the bosom of the hills, certain pallid, undersized men, who, by the side of the brawny country folk, looked like the remnants of a disinherited race. The shepherd's dog barked fiercely when one of these alien-looking men appeared on the upland, dark against the early winter sunset, for what dog likes a figure bent under a heavy bag? And these pale men rarely stirred abroad without that mysterious burden. The shepherd himself, though he had good reason to believe that the bag held nothing but flax and thread, or else the long rolls of strong linen spun from that thread, was not quite sure that this trade of weaving, indispensable though it was, could be carried on entirely without the help of the evil one. In that far-off time, superstition clung easily round every person or thing that was at all unwonted, or even intermittent and occasional merely, like the visits of the peddler or the knife-grinder. In the early years of that century, such a linen weaver, named Silas Marner, worked at his vocation in a stone cottage that stood among the nutty hedgerows near the village of Ravelo, and not far from the edge of a deserted stone pit. The questionable sound of Silas's loom had a half-fearful fascination for the Ravelo boys, who would often peep in at the window. But sometimes it happened that Marner, pausing to adjust an irregularity in his thread, became aware of the small scoundrels, and, though chary of his time, he liked their intrusion so ill that he would descend from his loom and, opening the door, would fix on them a gaze that was always enough to make them take to their legs in terror. For how is it possible to believe that those large brown protuberant eyes in Silas Marner's pale face really saw nothing very distinctly that was not close to them, and not rather that their dreadful stare could dart cramp or rickets, or a wry mouth at any boy who happened to be in the rear. For Ravelo was a village where many of the old echoes of demon worship lingered, undrowned by new voices. Not that it was one of those barren parishes lying on the outskirts of civilization, inhabited by meagre sheep and thinly scattered shepherds. On the contrary, it lay in the rich central plain of what we are pleased to call Merry England, and held farms which, speaking from a spiritual point of view, paid highly desirable tithes. But it was nestled in a snug, well-wooded hollow, quite an hour's journey on horseback from any turnpike, where it was never reached by the vibrations of the coach horn or of public opinion. It was fifteen years since Silas Marner had first come to Ravelow. He was then simply a pallid young man, with prominent, short-sighted brown eyes, whose appearance would have had nothing strange for people of average culture and experience. But for the villagers near whom he had come to settle, it had mysterious peculiarities, which corresponded with the exceptional nature of his occupation, and his advent from an unknown region called Northard. So had his way of life. He invited no comer to step across his door sill, and he never strolled into the village to drink a pint at the Rainbow, or to gossip at the wheelwrights. He sought no man or woman, save for the purposes of his calling, or in order to supply himself with necessaries. And the years had rolled on without producing any change in the impressions of the neighbours concerning Marna, except the change from novelty to habit. At the end of fifteen years, the Ravelow men had just the same suspicions about Silas Marna as at the beginning. They did not say them quite so often, but they believed them much more strongly when they did say them. There was only one important addition which the years had brought. It was that Master Marner had laid by a fine sight of money somewhere, and that he could buy up bigger men than himself. But while opinion concerning him had remained nearly stationary, and his daily habits had presented scarcely any visible change, Marner's inward life had been a history and a metamorphosis. Marner was highly thought of in that little hidden world known in his home town as the church assembling in Lantern Yard. He was believed to be a young man of exemplary life and ardent faith, and a peculiar interest had been centred in him ever since he had fallen, at a prayer meeting, into a mysterious rigidity and suspension of consciousness, which, lasting for an hour or more, had been mistaken for death. 
Silas was evidently a brother selected for a peculiar discipline, and though the effort to interpret this discipline was discouraged by the absence, on his part, of any spiritual vision during his outward trance, yet it was believed by himself and others that its effect was seen in an accession of light and fervour. Among the members of his church there was one young man, a little older than himself, with whom he had long lived in such close friendship that it was the custom of their lantern-yard brethren to call them David and Jonathan. The real name of the friend was William Dane, and he too was regarded as a shining instance of youthful piety, though somewhat given to over-severity towards weaker brethren, and to be so dazzled by his own light as to hold himself wiser than his teachers. But whatever blemishes others might discern in William, to his friend's mind, he was faultless. One of the most frequent topics of conversation between the two friends was assurance of salvation. Silas confessed that he could never arrive at anything higher than hope mingled with fear, and listened with longing wonder when William declared that he had possessed unshaken assurance ever since, in the period of his conversion, he had dreamed that he saw the words calling and election sure, standing by themselves on a white page in the open Bible. It had seemed to the unsuspecting Silas that the friendship had suffered no chill from his formation of another attachment of a closer kind. For some months he had been engaged to a young servant woman, waiting only for a little increase to their mutual savings in order to arrange their marriage and it was a great delight to him that Sarah did not object to William's occasional presence in their Sunday interviews. It was at this point in their history that Silas's cataleptic fit occurred during the prayer meeting. And amidst the various queries and expressions of interest addressed to him by his fellow members, William's suggestion alone jarred with the general sympathy. He observed that, to him, this trance looked more like a visitation of Satan than a proof of divine favour, and exhorted his friend to see that he hid no accursed thing within his soul. Silas, feeling bound to accept rebuke and admonition as a brotherly office, felt no resentment, but only pain, at his friend's doubt concerning him. And to this was soon added some anxiety, at the perception that Sarah's manner towards him began to exhibit a strange fluctuation between an increased manifestation of regard and involuntary signs of shrinking and dislike. He asked her if she wished to break off their engagement, but she denied this. Their engagement was known to the church and had been recognised in the prayer meetings. It could not be broken off without strict investigation, and Sarah could render no reason that would be sanctioned by the feeling of the community. At this time, the senior deacon was taken dangerously ill, and being a childless widower, he was tended night and day by some of the younger brethren or sisters. Silas frequently took his turn in the night watching with William, the one relieving the other at two in the morning. The old man, contrary to expectation, seemed to be on the way to recovery, when one night Silas, sitting up by his bedside, observed that his usual audible breathing had ceased. The candle was burning low, and he had to lift it to see the patient's face distinctly. Examination convinced him that the deacon was dead, had been dead for some time, for the limbs were rigid. Silas asked himself if he had been asleep, and looked at the clock. It was already four in the morning. How was it that William had not come? In much anxiety he went to seek for help, and soon there were several friends assembled in the house, the minister among them. While Silas went away to his work, wishing he could have met William to know the reason of his non-appearance. But at six o'clock, as he was thinking of going to seek his friend, William came, and with him the minister. They came to summon him to Lantern Yard to meet the church members there, and to his inquiry concerning the cause of the summons, the only reply was, You will hear. Nothing further was said, until Silas was seated in the vestry, in front of the minister, with the eyes of those who to him represented God's people fixed solemnly upon him. Then the minister, taking out a pocket-knife, showed it to Silas, and asked him if he knew where he had left that knife. Silas said he did not know that he had left it anywhere out of his own pocket. 
but he was trembling at this strange interrogation. He was then exhorted not to hide his sin, but to confess and repent. The knife had been found in the bureau by the departed deacon's bedside, found in the place where the little bag of church money had lain, which the minister himself had seen the day before. Some hand had removed that bag, and whose hand could it be, if not that of the man to whom the knife belonged? For some time Silas was mute with astonishment. Then he said, God will clear me. I know nothing about the knife being there, or the money being gone. Search me and my dwelling. You will find nothing but three pound five of my own savings, which William Dane knows I've had these six months. At this, William groaned, but the minister said, The proof is heavy against you, Brother Marner. The search was made, and it ended in William Dane's finding the well-known bag, empty, tucked behind the chest of drawers in Silas's chamber. On this, William exhorted his friend to confess and not to hide his sin any longer. Silas turned a look of keen reproach on him and said, William, for nine years that we have gone in and out together, have you ever known me to tell a lie? But God will clear me. Brother, said William, how do I know what you may have done in the secret chambers of your heart to give Satan an advantage over you? Silas was still looking at his friend. Suddenly a deep flush came over his face, and he was about to speak impetuously when he seemed checked again by some inward shock that sent the flush back and made him tremble. But at last he spoke feebly, looking at William. I remember now. The knife wasn't in my pocket. William said, I know nothing of what you mean. The other persons present, however, began to inquire where Silas meant to say that the knife was, but he would give no further explanation. He only said, I am sore stricken. I can say nothing. God will clear me. On their return to the vestry, there was further deliberation. Any resort to legal measures for ascertaining the culprit was contrary to the principles of the church in Lantern Yard. But the members were bound to take other measures for finding out the truth, and they resolved on praying and drawing lots. Silas knelt with his brethren, relying on his own innocence being certified by immediate divine interference. But feeling that there was sorrow and mourning behind for him even then, that his trust in man had been cruelly bruised. The lots declared that Silas Marner was guilty. He was solemnly suspended from church membership and called upon to render up the stolen money. Marner listened in silence. At last, when everyone rose to depart, he went towards William Dane and said, in a voice shaken by agitation. The last time I remember using my knife was when I took it out to cut a strap for you. I don't remember putting it in my pocket again. You stole the money, and you have woven a plot to lay this in at my door. But you may prosper for all that. There is no just God that governs the earth righteously, but a God of lies that bears witness against the innocent. There was a general shudder at this blasphemy. William said meekly, I leave our brethren to judge whether this is the voice of Satan or not. I can do nothing but pray for you, Silas. Poor Marner went out with that despair in his soul, that shaken trust in God and man, which is little short of madness to a loving nature. In the bitterness of his wounded spirit, he said to himself, She will cast me off too. Marner went home, and for a whole day sat alone, stunned by despair, without any impulse to go to Sarah and attempt to win her belief in his innocence. The second day he took refuge from benumbing unbelief by getting into his loom and working away as usual, and before many hours were passed, the minister and one of the deacons came to him with the message from Sarah that she held her engagement to him at an end. Silas received the message mutely, and then turned away from the messengers to work at his loom again. In little more than a month from that time, Sarah was married to William Dane, and not long afterwards it was known to the brethren in Lantern Yard that Silas Marner had departed from the town. Marner's first movement after the shock had been to work in his loom, 
and he went on with this unremittingly, never asking himself why, now he was come to Ravelow, he worked far on into the night. He seemed to weave like a spider, from pure impulse, without reflection. Every man's work, pursued steadily, tends in this way to become an end in itself, and so to bridge over the loveless chasms of his life. Silas's hand satisfied itself with throwing the shuttle, and his eye with seeing the little squares in the cloth complete themselves under his effort. Silas was paid in gold, but what were the guineas to him who saw no vista beyond countless days of weaving? It was needless for him to ask that, for it was pleasant to him to feel them in his palm and look at their bright faces which were all his own. It was another element of life, like the weaving and the satisfaction of hunger, subsisting quite aloof from the life of belief and love from which he had been cut off. The weaver's hand had known the touch of hard-won money even before the palm had grown to its full breadth. For twenty years, mysterious money had stood to him as the symbol of earthly good and the immediate object of toil. He had seemed to love it little in the years when every penny had its purpose for him, for he loved the purpose then. But now, when all purpose was gone, that habit of looking towards the money and grasping it with a sense of fulfilled effort made a loam that was deep enough for the seeds of desire. And whenever Silas walked homeward across the fields in the twilight, after delivering some linen, he drew out the money and thought it was brighter in the gathering gloom. About this time an incident happened which seemed to open a possibility of some fellowship with his neighbours. One day, Taking a pair of shoes to be mended, he saw Sally Oates, the cobbler's wife, seated by the fire, suffering from the terrible symptoms of heart disease and dropsy, which he had witnessed as the precursors of his mother's death. He felt a rush of pity at the mingled sight and remembrance, and recalling the relief his mother had found from a simple preparation of foxglove, he promised Sally to bring her something that would ease her, since the doctor did her no good. In this office of charity, Silas felt, for the first time since he had come to Ravelow, a sense of unity between his past and present life, which might have been the beginning of his rescue from the insect-like existence into which his nature had shrunk. But Sally Oates's disease had raised her into a personage of much interest and importance among the neighbours, and the fact of her having found relief from drinking Silas Marner's stuff became a matter of general discourse. When Dr. Kimball gave physic, it was natural that it should have an effect. But when a weaver, who came from nobody knew where, worked wonders with a bottle of brown waters, the occult character of the process was evident. Silas now found himself and his cottage suddenly beset by mothers who wanted him to charm away the whooping cough or bring back the milk, and by men who wanted stuff against the rheumatics or the knots in the hands, and to secure themselves against a refusal, the applicants brought silver in their palms. Silas might have driven a profitable trade in charms, as well as in his small list of drugs, but money on this condition was no temptation to him, and he drove, one after another, away with growing irritation, for the news of him as a wise man had spread, and it was long before people ceased to take long walks for the sake of asking his aid. Thus it came to pass that his movements of pity towards Sally Oates, which had given him a transient sense of brotherhood, heightened the repulsion between him and his neighbours, and made his isolation more complete. Gradually the guineas, the crowns, and the half-crown earned from weaving grew to a heap, and Marner drew less and less for his own wants, trying to solve the problem of keeping himself strong enough to work sixteen hours a day on as small an outlay as possible. Marner wanted the heaps of ten to grow into a square, and then into a larger square, and every added guinea, while it was itself a satisfaction, bred a new desire. He began to think the money was conscious of him, as his loom was, and he would on no account have exchanged those coins which had become his familiars for other coins with unknown faces. He handled them, he counted them, till their form and colour were like the satisfaction of a thirst to him. 
but it was only in the night, when his work was done, that he drew them out to enjoy their companionship. He had taken up some bricks in his floor underneath his loom, and here he had made a hole in which he set the iron pot that contained his guineas and silver coins. So, year after year, Silas Marner had lived in this solitude, his guineas rising in the iron pot, and his life narrowing and hardening itself more and more into a mere pulsation of desire and satisfaction that had no relation to any other being. His life had reduced itself to the functions of weaving and hoarding, without any contemplation of an end towards which the functions tended. Strangely, Marner's face and figure shrank and bent themselves into a constant mechanical relation to the objects of his life, so that he had produced the same sort of impression as a handle or a crooked tube, which has no meaning standing apart. The prominent eyes that used to look trusting and dreamy now looked as if they had been made to see only one kind of thing that was very small, like tiny grain, for which they hunted everywhere. And he was so withered and yellow that, although he was not yet forty, the children always called him Old Master Mana. This is the history of Silas Mana until the fifteenth year after he came to Ravelow. The live-long day he sat in his loom, his ear filled with its monotony, his eyes bent close down on the slow growth of sameness in the brownish web, his muscles moving with such even repetition that their pause seemed almost as much a constraint as the holding of his breath. But at night came his revelry. At night he closed his shutters and made fast his doors and drew forth his gold. Long ago the heap of coins had become too large for the iron pot to hold them, and he had made for them two thick leather bags, which wasted no room in their resting place, but lent themselves flexibly to every corner. How the guineas shone as they came pouring out of the dark leather mouths! The silver bore no large proportion in amount to the gold, because the long pieces of linen which formed his chief work were always partly paid for in gold and out of the silver he supplied his own bodily wants, choosing always the shillings and the sixpences to spend in this way. But about the Christmas of that fifteenth year, a second great change came over Marner's life, and his history became blent in a singular manner with the life of his neighbours. The greatest man in Ravelow was Squire Cass, who lived in the large red house with the handsome flight of stone steps in front and the high stables behind it, nearly opposite the church. Ravelow lay low among the bushy trees and the rutted lanes, aloof from the current of industrial energy and Puritan earnestness. The rich ate and drank freely, accepting gout and apoplexy as things that ran mysteriously in respectable families, and the poor thought that the rich were entirely in the right of it to lead a jolly life. Ravelo feasts were like the rounds of beef and the barrels of ale. They were on a large scale and lasted a good while, especially in the winter time. For the squire's wife had died long ago, and the red house was without that presence of the wife and mother which is the fountain of wholesome love and fear in parlour and kitchen, and this helped to account not only for there being more profusion than finished excellence in the holiday provisions, but also for the frequency with which the proud squire condescended to preside in the parlour of the rainbow, rather than under the shadow of his own dark wainscot, perhaps also for the fact that his two sons had turned out rather ill. People shook their heads at the courses of the second son, Dunstan, commonly called Dunsey Cass, whose taste for swapping and betting might turn out to be a sowing of something worse than wild oats. To be sure, the neighbours said, it was no matter what became of Dunsey, a spiteful, jeering fellow, who seemed to enjoy his drink the more when other people went dry, always provided that his doings did not bring trouble on a family like Squire Cass's, with a monument in the church, and tankards older than King George. But it would be a thousand pities if Mr. Godfrey, the eldest, 
a fine, open-faced, good-natured young man, who was to come into the land some day, should take to going along the same road with his brother, as he seemed to do of late. If he went on in that way, he would lose Miss Nancy Lameter, for it was well known that she had looked very shyly on him ever since last Whitsuntide twelve-month, when there was so much talk about his being away from home days and days together. There was something wrong, more than common, that was quite clear, for Mr. Godfrey didn't look half so fresh-coloured and open as he used to. It was the once hopeful Godfrey who was standing, with his hands in his side pockets and his back to the fire, in the dark wainscoted parlour, one late November afternoon, in that fifteenth year of Silas Marner's life at Ravelow. He seemed to be waiting and listening for someone's approach, and presently the sound of a heavy step with an accompanying whistle was heard across the large, empty entrance hall. The door opened, and a thick-set, heavy-looking young man entered, with a flushed face and the gratuitously elated bearing which marked the first stage of intoxication. It was Dunsey, and at the sight of him Godfrey's face parted with some of its gloom to take on the more active expression of hatred. "'Well, Master Godfrey, what do you want with me?' said Dunsey in a mocking tone. You're my elders and betters, you know. I was obliged to come when you sent for me. Why, this is what I want. And just shake yourself sober and listen, will you? said Godfrey, savagely. I want to tell you I must hand over that rent of Fowler's to the squire, or else tell him I gave it to you, for his threatening to distrain for it, and it'll all be out soon, whether I tell him or not. So see and get the money, and pretty quickly, will you? Oh! said Dunsey, sneeringly, coming nearer to his brother and looking in his face. Suppose now you get the money yourself, and save me the trouble, eh? Since you were so kind as to hand it over to me, you'll not refuse me the kindness to pay it back for me. It was your brotherly love made you do it, you know. Godfrey bit his lips and clenched his fist. Don't come near me with that look, else I'll knock you down. Oh, no, you won't, said Dunsey turning away on his heel, however. "'Because I'm such a good-natured brother, you know. I might get you turned out of house and home and cut off with a shilling any day. I might tell the squire how his handsome son was married to that nice young woman, Molly Farron, and was very unhappy because he couldn't live with his drunken wife, and I should slip into your place as comfortable as can be. But you see, I don't do it. I'm so easy and good-natured.' You'll take any trouble for me. You'll get the hundred pounds for me. I know you will. Dunstan was moving off, but Godfrey rushed after him and seized him by the arm, saying with an oath, I tell you, I have no money. I can get no money. Borrow off old Kimball. I tell you, he won't lend me any more, and I shan't ask him. Well, then I can't help you. How's Miss Nancy? I imagine you'll be seeing her at Mrs. Osgood's birthday dance tomorrow. Hold your tongue about Miss Nancy, you fool, said Godfrey, turning red. Else I'll throttle you. What for? said Dunstan, still in an artificial tone, but taking a whip from the table and beating the butt end of it on his palm. You've a very good chance. I'd advise you to creep up her sleeve again. It'd be saving time, if Molly should happen to take a drop too much laudanum some day and make a widower of you. Miss Nancy wouldn't mind being a second if she didn't know it, and you've got a good-natured brother who'll keep your secret well, because you'll be so very obliging to him. I'll tell you what it is, said Godfrey, quivering and pale again. My patience is pretty near at an end. If you'd a little more sharpness in you, you might know that you may urge a man a bit too far and make one leap as easy as another. I don't know but what it is so now. I may as well tell the squire everything myself. I should get you off my back if I got nothing else. And after all, he'll know sometime. She's been threatening to come herself and tell him. So don't flatter yourself that your secrecy is worth any price you choose to ask. You drain me of money till I have nothing to pacify her with, and she'll do as she threatens some day. It's all one. I'll tell my father everything myself, and you may go to the devil. Dunsey perceived that he had overshot his mark, and that there was a point at which even the hesitating Godfrey might be driven into decision. But he said, with an air of unconcern, As you please. 
With that, Dunstan went from the room and left Godfrey to that bitter rumination on his personal circumstances, which was now unbroken from day to day, save by the excitement of sporting, drinking, card playing, or the rather less oblivious pleasure of seeing Miss Nancy Lameter. The idea occurred to Dunstan Cass, who had often heard talk of Silas Marner's miserliness, that he should frighten or persuade the old fellow into lending the money. The resource occurred to him now as so easy and agreeable, especially as Marner's hoard was likely to be large enough to leave Godfrey a handsome surplus beyond his immediate needs, and enable him to accommodate his faithful brother. The following evening, therefore, Dunstan set off for Silas Marner's cottage by the stone pits. That cottage, and the money hidden within it, were in his mind continually during his walk, and he had been imagining ways of cajoling and tempting the weaver to part with the immediate possession of his money for the sake of receiving interest. Dunstan felt as if there must be a little frightening added to the cajolery, and as for security, he regarded it vaguely as a means of cheating a man by making him believe that he would be paid. By the time he saw the light gleaming through the chinks of Marner's shutters, the idea of a dialogue with the weaver had become so familiar to him that it occurred to him as quite a natural thing to make the acquaintance forthwith. At the door he knocked loudly, rather enjoying the idea that the old fellow would be frightened at the sudden noise. He heard no movement in reply. All was silence in the cottage. Was the weaver gone to bed, then? If so, why had he left a light? That was a strange forgetfulness in a miser. Dunstan knocked still more loudly, and without pausing for a reply, pushed his fingers through the latch hole, intending to shake the door and pull the latch string up and down, not doubting that the door was fastened. But to his surprise, at this double motion, the door opened, and he found himself in front of a bright fire which lit up every corner of the cottage, the bed, the loom, the three chairs, and the table, and showed him that Marner was not there. Nothing at that moment could be much more inviting to Dunsey than the bright fire on the brick hearth. He walked in and seated himself by it at once. There was something in front of the fire, too, that would have been inviting to a hungry man, if it had been in a different stage of cooking. It was a small bit of pork, suspended from the kettle hanger by a string passed through a large door key, in a way known to primitive housekeepers unpossessed of jacks. But the pork had been hung at the farthest extremity of the hanger, apparently to prevent the roasting from proceeding too rapidly during the owner's absence. The old staring simpleton had hot meat for his supper, then, thought Dunstan. People had always said he lived on mouldy bread, on purpose to check his appetite. But where could he be at this time, and on such an evening, leaving his supper in this stage of preparation, and his door unfastened? Dunstan's first thought was that the weaver had perhaps gone outside his cottage to fetch in fuel, or for some such brief purpose, and had slipped into the stone pit. That was an interesting idea to Dunstan, carrying consequences of entire novelty. If the weaver was dead, who had a right to his money? Who would know where his money was hidden? Who would know that anybody had come to take it away? He went no further into the subtleties of evidence. The pressing question, where is the money, now took such entire possession of him as to make him quite forget that the weaver's death was not a certainty. A dull mind, once arriving at an inference that flatters a desire, is rarely able to retain the impression that the notion from which the inference started was purely problematic. And Dunstan's mind was as dull as the mind of a possible felon usually is. There were only three hiding places where he had ever heard of cottagers' hoards being found, the thatch, the bed, and a hole in the floor. Marner's cottage had no thatch, and Dunstan's first act, after a train of thought made rapid by the stimulus of cupidity, was to go up to the bed. But while he did so, his eyes travelled eagerly over the floor, where the bricks, distinct in the firelight, were discernible under the sprinkling of sand. But not everywhere, for there was one spot, and one only, which was quite covered with sand, and sand showing the marks of fingers, which had apparently been careful to spread it over a given space. It was near the treadles of the loom. In an instant, Dunstan darted to that spot, 
swept away the sand and found that the bricks were loose. In haste, he lifted up two bricks and saw what he had no doubt was the object of his search, for what could there be but money in those two leathern bags? And from their weight they must be filled with guineas. Dunstan felt round the hole to be certain that it held no more, then hastily replaced the bricks and spread the sand over them. Hardly more than five minutes had passed since he entered the cottage, but it seemed to Dunstan like a long while. He rose to his feet with the bags in his hand. He would hasten out into the darkness and then consider what he should do with the bags. He closed the door behind him immediately that he might shut in the stream of light. The rain and darkness had got thicker, and he was glad of it, though it was awkward walking with both hands filled. When he had gone a yard or two, he might take his time. So he hastened forward into the darkness. When Dunstan Cass turned his back on the cottage, Silas Marner was not more than a hundred yards away from it, plodding home from the village, with a sack thrown round his shoulders as an overcoat, and with a horn lantern in his hand. His legs were weary, but his mind was at ease, free from the presentiment of change. He reached his door in much satisfaction that his errand was done. He opened it, and to his short-sighted eyes everything remained as he had left it, except that the fire sent out a welcome increase of heat. He sat down to the agreeable business of tending the meat and warming himself at the same time. As soon as he was warm, he began to think it would be a long time to wait till after supper before he drew out his guineas, and it would be pleasant to see them on the table before him as he ate his meal. For joy is best of wines, and Silas's guineas were a golden wine of that sort. He rose and placed his candle unsuspectingly on the floor near his loom, swept away the sand without noticing any change, and removed the bricks. The sight of the empty hole made his heart leap violently, but the belief that his gold was gone could not come at once, only terror, and the eager effort to put an end to the terror. He passed his trembling hand all about the hole, trying to think it possible that his eyes had deceived him. Then he held a candle in the hole and examined it curiously, trembling more and more. At last he shook so violently that he let fall the candle, and lifted his hands to his head, trying to steady himself, that he might think. Had he put his gold somewhere else, by a sudden resolution last night, and then forgotten it? A man, falling into dark waters, seeks a momentary footing, even on sliding stones, and Silas, by acting as if he believed in false hopes, warded off the moment of despair. He searched in every corner, he turned his bed over, and shook it, and kneaded it. He looked in his brick oven where he laid his sticks. When there was no other place to be searched, he kneeled down again, and felt once more all round the hole. There was no untried refuge left for a moment's shelter from the terrible truth. And now that all the false hopes had vanished, and the first shock of certainty was past, the idea of a thief began to present itself, and he entertained it eagerly, because a thief might be caught and made to restore the gold. Yet everything was the same as when he had left it. The sand and bricks looked as if they had not been moved. Was it a thief who had taken the bags, or was it a cruel power that no hands could reach, which had delighted in making him a second time desolate? He shrank from his vaguer dread, and fixed his mind with struggling effort on the robber with hands who could be reached by hands. He rushed out in the rain, under the stimulus of this hope, forgetting to cover his head, not caring to fasten his door, for he felt as if he had nothing left to lose. He ran swiftly, till want of breath compelled him to slacken his pace as he was entering the village at the turning close to the Rainbow Inn. The Rainbow, in Marner's view, was the place where he could most speedily make his loss public. He lifted the latch and turned into the bar. The conversation was at a high pitch of animation when the pale, thin figure of Silas Marner was suddenly seen standing in the warm light, uttering no word, but looking round at the company with his strange, unearthly eyes. For a few moments there was a dead silence, Marner's want of breath and agitation not allowing him to speak. The landlord, under the habitual sense that he was bound to keep his house open to all company, at last took on himself the task of adjuring the apparition. "'Master Marner,' he said, in a conciliatory tone, "'what's lacking to you? 
What's your business here? Robbed, said Silas, gaspingly. I've been robbed. I want the constable, and the justice, and Squire Cass, and Mr. Crackenthorpe. Lay hold on him, Jem Rodney, said the landlord. He's off his head, I doubt. He's wet through. Jem Rodney was the outermost man, and sat conveniently near Marna's standing place, but he declined to give his services. Come and lay hold on him yourself, Mr. Snell, if you've a mind, said Jem, rather sullenly. He's been robbed, and murdered too, for what I know, he added in a muttering tone. Jem Rodney, said Silas, turning and fixing his strange eyes on the suspected man. I'm Master Marna, do what you want with me, said Jem, trembling a little, and seizing his drinking can as a defensive weapon. If it was you stole my money, said Silas, clasping his hands entreatingly, and raising his voice to a cry, give it back, and I won't meddle with you, I won't set constable on you, give it me back, and I'll let you, I'll let you have a guinea. Me stole your money, said Jem, angrily. I'll pitch this can at your eye if you talk of my stealing your money. Come, come, Master Marner, said the landlord, now rising resolutely and seizing Marner by the shoulder. If you've got any information to lay, speak it out sensible and show us you're in your right mind. If you expect anybody to listen to you, you're as wet as a drowned rat. Sit down and dry yourself and speak straight forward. The landlord forced Marner to take off his coat, and then to sit down on a chair, aloof from everyone else, in the centre of the circle, and in the direct rays of the fire. The weaver, too feeble to have any distinct purpose, beyond that of getting help to recover his money, submitted unresistingly. All faces were turned towards Silas, when the landlord, having seated himself again, said, "'Now then, Master Marner, what's this you've got to say?' "'As you've been robbed, speak out.' "'He'd better not say against as it was me robbed him,' cried Jem Rodney hastily. "'What could I have done with his money? "'I could as easy steal a parson's surplus and wear it.' "'Hold your tongue, Jem, unless hear what he's got to say,' said the landlord. "'Now then, Master Marner.' Silas now told his story, under frequent questioning, as the mysterious character of the robbery became evident. The strangely novel situation of opening his trouble to his Ravelo neighbours, of sitting in the warmth of a hearth not his own, and feeling the presence of faces and voices which were his nearest promise of help, had doubtless its influence on Marna, in spite of his passionate preoccupation with his loss. The slight suspicion with which his hearers at first listened to him gradually melted away before the convincing simplicity of his distress— it was impossible for the neighbours to doubt that Marner was telling the truth. "'It isn't Jem Rodney has done this work, Master Marner,' said the landlord. "'You mustn't be a cast in your eye at poor Jem. There may be a bit of reckoning against Jem for the matter of a hair or so, if anybody was bound to keep their eyes staring open, and never to wink. But Jem's been a-sitting here drinking his can like the decentest man in the parish since before you left your house, Master Marner, by your own account.' "'Aye, aye!' said Mr. Macy, the tailor and parish clerk. "'Let's have no accusing of the innocent!' Memory was not so utterly torpid in Silas that it could not be wakened by these words. "'I was wrong,' he said. "'Yes, yes, I ought to have thought. "'There's nothing to witness against you, Jem. "'I won't accuse anybody, only,' he added, "'lifting up his hands to his head. "'I try, I try to think where my guineas can be.' "'Aye, aye, they're gone where it's hot enough to melt them, I doubt,' said Mr. Macy. "'Tchah!' said the farrier. And then he asked, with a cross-examining air, "'How much money might there be in the bags, Master Marner?' Two hundred and seventy-two pounds, twelve and sixpence, last night when I counted it,' said Silas, seating himself again with a groan. "'Poof! Why, there'd be none so heavy to carry. Some tramp spinning, that's all.' And as for the no footmarks, and the bricks, and sand all being all right, why, your eyes are pretty much like an insect's, Master Marner. They're obliged to look so close, you can't see much at a time. It's my opinion, as if I'd been you, or you'd been me, for it comes to the same thing, you wouldn't have thought you'd found everything as you left it. But what I vote is, as two of the sensiblest of the company should go with you to Master Kench, the constables. He's ill in bed, I know that and get him to appoint one of us as deputy, for that's the law, and I don't think anybody'll take upon him to contradict me there. Tis much of a war to Kench's, and then, 
If it's me as his deputy, I'll go back with you, Master Marner, and examine your premises. And if anybody's got any fault to find with that, I'll thank him to stand up and say it out like a man. The farrier waited with confidence to hear himself named as one of the superlatively sensible men. Let us see how the night is, though, said the landlord, who also considered himself personally concerned in this proposition. Why, it rains heavy still, he said, returning from the door. Well, I'm not the man to be afraid of the rain, said the farrier, for it'll look bad when Justice Malam hears as respectable men like us had an information laid before him and took no steps. The landlord agreed with this view, and after taking the sense of the company, he consented to take on himself the chill dignity of going to Kench's. And so poor Silas, furnished with some old coverings, turned out with his two companions into the rain again, thinking of the long night hours before him, not as those do who long to rest, but as those who expect to watch for the morning. When Godfrey Cass returned from Mrs. Osgood's party at midnight, he was not much surprised to learn that Dunsey had not come home. Godfrey's mind was too full of Nancy Lamater's looks and behaviour, too full of the exasperation against himself and his lot, which the sight of her always produced in him, for him to give much thought to his brother's whereabouts. The next morning the whole village was excited by the story of the robbery, and Godfrey, like everyone else, was occupied in gathering and discussing news about it, and in visiting the stone pits. The rain had washed away all possibility of distinguishing footmarks, but a close investigation of the spot had disclosed, in the direction opposite to the village, a tinder-box with a flint and steel, half sunk in the mud. It was not Silas's tinder-box, for the only one he had ever had was still standing on his shelf, and the inference generally accepted was that the tinder-box in the ditch was somehow connected with the robbery. A small minority shook their heads and intimated their opinion that it was not a robbery to have much light thrown on it by tinder-boxes, that Master Marner's tale had a queer look with it, and that such things had been known as a man's doing himself a mischief, and then setting the justice to look for the doer. But when questioned closely as to their grounds for this opinion, and what Master Marner had to gain by such false pretenses, they only shook their heads as before, and observed that there was no knowing what some folks counted gain, and that the weaver, as everybody knew, was partly crazy. But by this time Godfrey's interest in the robbery had faded before his growing anxiety about his own financial affairs. He already imagined the scene of confession to his father, from which he felt that there was now no longer any escape. The revelation about the money must be made the very next morning, and if he withheld the rest, Dunstan would be sure to come back shortly, and finding that he must bear the brunt of his father's anger, would tell the whole story out of spite, even though he had nothing to gain by it. There was one step, perhaps, by which he might still win Dunstan's silence and put off the evil day. He might tell his father that he had himself spent the money paid to him by Fowler, and as he had never been guilty of such an offence before, the affair would blow over after a little storming. But Godfrey could not bend himself to this. He felt that in letting Dunstan have the money, he had already been guilty of a breach of trust hardly less culpable than that of spending the money directly for his own behoof. And yet there was a distinction between the two acts which made him feel that the one was so much more blackening than the other as to be intolerable to him. "'I don't pretend to be a good fellow,' he said to himself, "'but I'm not a scoundrel. At least I'll stop short somewhere.' I'll bear the consequences of what I have done sooner than make believe I've done what I never would have done. I'd never have spent the money for my own pleasure. I was tortured into it. Through the remainder of this day, Godfrey, with only occasional fluctuations, kept his will bent in the direction of a complete avowal to his father. The old squire was accustomed to his younger son's frequent absences from home, and thought Dunstan's non-appearance not a matter calling for a mark. Godfrey said to himself, again and again, that if he let slip this one opportunity of confession, he might never have another. The revelation might be made even in a more odious way than by Dunstan's malignity. She might come as she had threatened to do. And then he tried to make the scene easier to himself by rehearsal. 
He made up his mind how he would pass from the admission of his weakness in letting Dunstan have the money to the fact that Dunstan had a hold on him which he had been unable to shake off, and how he would work up his father to expect something very bad before he told him the fact. There was just the chance, Godfrey thought, that his father's pride might see this marriage in a light that would induce him to hush it up, rather than turn his son out and make the family the talk of the country for ten miles round. This was the view of the case that Godfrey managed to keep before him pretty closely till midnight, and he went to sleep thinking that he had done with inward debating. But when he awoke in the still morning darkness, he found it impossible to reawaken his evening thoughts. It was as if they had been tired out and were not to be roused to further work. Instead of arguments for confession, he could now feel the presence of nothing but its evil consequences. The old dread of disgrace came back, the old shrinking from the thought of raising a hopeless barrier between himself and Nancy, the old disposition to rely on chances which might be favourable to him and save him from betrayal. Why, after all, should he cut off the hope by his own act? He had seen the matter in a wrong light yesterday. He had been in a rage with Dunstan, and had thought of nothing but a thorough break-up of their mutual understanding. But what it would be really wisest for him to do was to try and soften his father's anger against Dunsey, and keep things as nearly as possible in their old condition. If Dunsey did not come back for a few days, and Godfrey did not know but that the rascal had enough money in his pocket to enable him to keep away still longer, everything might blow over. Next morning, Godfrey rose and took his own breakfast earlier than usual, but lingered in the wainscoted parlour, awaiting his father. The squire glanced at his son as he entered the room and said, "'What, sir? Haven't you had your breakfast yet?' But there was no pleasant morning greeting between them, not because of any unfriendliness, but because the sweet flower of courtesy is not a growth of such homes as the Red House. "'Yes, sir,' said Godfrey. I've had my breakfast, but I was waiting to speak to you. Oh, well, said the squire, throwing himself indifferently into his chair, and speaking in a ponderous, coughing fashion, which was felt in Ravelot to be a sort of privilege of his rank. Godfrey stammered. I, I'm sorry, sir. I should have paid you a hundred pounds this morning. The squire had laid down his knife and fork, and was staring at his son in amazement. "'The truth is, sir, uh, I'm very sorry, I was quite to blame,' said Godfrey. "'Fowler did pay that hundred pounds. "'He paid it to me when I was over there one day last month, "'and Dunsey bothered me for the money, and I let him have it, "'because I hoped I should be able to pay it you before this.' "'The squire was purple with anger before his son had done speaking, "'and found utterance difficult. "'You let Dunsey have it, sir?' "'And how long have you been so thick with Dunsey "'that you must conspire with him to embezzle my money? "'Are you turning out a scamp? "'I tell you, I won't have it. "'I'll turn you out of the house altogether and marry again. "'I'll have you remember, sir, my property's got no entail on it. "'Since my grandfather's time, the Cassis can do as they like with their land. "'Remember that, sir. "'Let Dunsey have the money. "'Why should you let Dunsey have the money? "'There's some lie at the bottom of it.' "'There's no lie, sir,' said Godfrey. "'I wouldn't have spent the money myself, but Dunsey bothered me, and I was a fool and let him have it. But I meant to pay it, whether he did or not. That's the whole story. I never meant to embezzle money. I'm not the man to do it. You never knew me do a dishonest trick, sir. "'Where's Dunsey, then? What do you stand talking there for?' Go and fetch Dunsey, as I tell you, and let him give account of what he wanted the money for, and what he's done with it. He shall repent it. I'll turn him out. I said I would, and I'll do it. He shan't brave me. Go and fetch him. Dunsey isn't come back, sir. What? I dare say we shall see him again by and by. I don't know where he is. 
And what must you be letting him have my money for? Answer me that, said the squire, attacking Godfrey again, since Dunsey was not within reach. Well, sir, I, I don't know, said Godfrey, hesitatingly. That was a feeble evasion, but Godfrey was not fond of lying, and not being sufficiently aware that no sort of duplicity can long flourish without the help of vocal falsehoods, he was quite unprepared with inventive motives. You don't know? I'll tell you what it is, sir. You've been up to some trick, and you've been bribing him not to tell, said the squire, with a sudden acuteness which startled Godfrey, who felt his heart beat violently at the nearness of his father's guess. The sudden alarm pushed him on to take the next step. A very slight impulse suffices for that on a downward road. Why, sir, he said, trying to speak with careless ease, it was a little affair between me and Dunsey. It's no matter to anybody else. It's hardly worth while to pry into young men's fooleries. It wouldn't have made any difference to you, sir, if I could have paid you the money. Fooleries? Pshaw! It's time you'd done with fooleries. And I'd have you know, sir, you must have done with them, said the squire, frowning and casting an angry glance at his son. Your goings-on are not what I shall find money for any longer. There's my grandfather had his stables full of horses, and kept a good house, too, and in worse times, by what I can make out, and so might I, if I hadn't two good-for-nothing fellows to hang on me like horse leeches. I've been too good a father to you, that's what it is, but I shall pull up, sir. Godfrey was silent. He was not likely to be very penetrating in his judgments, but he had always had a sense that his father's indulgence had not been kindness, and had had a vague longing for some discipline that would have checked his own errant weakness and helped his better will. The squire ate his breakfast hastily, then turned his chair from the table and began to speak again. "'It'll be all the worse for you, you know. You need try and help me keep things together.' Well, sir, I've often offered to take the management of things, but you know you've taken it ill always, and seem to think I wanted to push you out of your place. I know nothing of your offering, or am I taking ill, said the squire, whose memory consisted in certain strong impressions unmodified by detail. But I know one while you seem to be thinking of marrying, and I didn't offer to put any obstacles in your way, as some fathers would. I'd as lief you married Lamata's daughter as anybody— I suppose if I'd said you nay, you'd have kept on with it. But for want of contradiction, you've changed your mind. You're a shilly-shally fellow. You take after your poor mother. She never had a will of her own. Well, a woman has no call for one, if she's got a proper man for her husband. But your wife had need of one, for you hardly know your own mind enough to make both your legs walk one way. The lass hasn't said downright she won't have you, has she? No, said Godfrey, feeling very hot and uncomfortable. But I don't think she will. Think? Well, haven't you the courage to ask her? Just stick to it. You want to have her. That's the thing. There's no other woman I want to marry, said Godfrey, evasively. Well, then let me make the offer for you, that's all, if you haven't the pluck to do it for yourself. Lameter isn't like to be loath for his daughter to marry into my family, I should think. And as for the pretty lass, she wouldn't have a cousin, and there's nobody else, as I see, could have stood in your way. I'd rather let it be, please, sir, at present, said Godfrey in alarm. I think she's a little offended with me just now, and I should like to speak for myself. A man must manage these things for himself. Well, speak then, and manage it, and see if you can't turn over a new leaf. That's what a man must do when he thinks of marrying. Godfrey left the room, hardly knowing whether he were more relieved by the sense that the interview was ended without having made any change in his position, or more uneasy that he had entangled himself still further in prevarication and deceit. What had passed about his proposing to Nancy had raised a new alarm, lest by some after-dinner words of his father's to Mr. Lameter he should be thrown into the embarrassment of being obliged absolutely to decline her when she seemed to be within his reach. He fled to his usual refuge, that of hoping for some unforeseen turn of fortune, some favourable chance which would save him from unpleasant consequences. Justice Malham was naturally regarded in Ravelo as a man of capacious mind, 
seeing that he could draw much wider conclusions about evidence than could be expected of his neighbours who were not on the commission of the peace. Such a man was not likely to neglect the clue of the tinderbox, and an inquiry was set on foot concerning a peddler seen in the village that day, name unknown, with curly black hair and a foreign complexion, carrying a box of cutlery and jewellery, and wearing large rings in his ears. But either because inquiry was too slow-footed to overtake him, or because the description applied to so many peddlers that inquiry did not know how to choose among them, weeks passed away, and there was no other result concerning the robbery than a gradual cessation of the excitement it had caused in Ravelo. Dunstan Cass's absence was hardly a subject of remark. He had once before had a quarrel with his father, and had gone off, nobody knew whither, to return at the end of six weeks, take up his old quarter, unforbidden, and swagger as usual. His own family, who equally expected this issue, never mentioned his absence, and when his uncle Kimball, or Mr. Osgood, noticed it, the story of his having committed some offence against his father was enough to prevent surprise. To connect the fact of Dunn's disappearance with that of the robbery occurring on the same day lay quite away from the track of everyone's thought, even Godfrey's, who had better reason than anyone else to know what his brother was capable of. When the robbery was talked of at the Rainbow and elsewhere, in good company, the balance continued to waver between the rational explanation founded on the tinderbox and the theory of an impenetrable mystery that mocked investigation. But while poor Silas's loss served thus to brush the slow current of Ravelo conversation, Silas himself was feeling the withering desolation of that bereavement about which his neighbours were arguing at their ease. To anyone who had observed him before he lost his gold, it might have seemed that so withered and shrunken a life as his could hardly be susceptible of a bruise, could hardly endure any subtraction but such as would put an end to it altogether. But in reality, it had been an eager life, filled with immediate purpose, which fenced him in from the wide, cheerless unknown. But now the fence was broken down, the support was snatched away, Marna's thoughts could no longer move in their old round. The loom was there, and the weaving, and the growing pattern of cloth, but the bright treasure in the hole under his feet was gone, the prospect of handling and counting it was gone. The evening had no phantasm of delight to still the poor soul's craving. The thought of the money he would get by his actual work could bring no joy, for his meagre image was only a fresh reminder of his loss, and hope was too heavily crushed by the sudden blow for his imagination to dwell on the growth of a new hoard from that small beginning. He filled up the blank with grief. As he sat weaving, he every now and then moaned low, like one in pain. It was a sign that his thoughts had come round again to the sudden chasm, to the empty evening time. And all the evening, as he sat in his loneliness by his dull fire, he leaned his elbows on his knees and clasped his head with his hands and moaned very low, not as one who seeks to be heard. It was New Year's Eve, and while Godfrey Cass was taking draughts of forgetfulness from the sweet presence of Nancy at the dance at the Red House, willingly losing all sense of that hidden bond which at other moments galled and fretted him so as to mingle irritation with the very sunshine, Godfrey's wife was walking with slow, uncertain steps through the snow-covered Ravelo lanes, carrying her child in her arms. This journey, on New Year's Eve, was a premeditated act of vengeance, which she had kept in her heart ever since Godfrey, in a fit of passion, had told her he would sooner die than acknowledge her as his wife. There would be a great party at the Red House on New Year's Eve, she knew. Her husband would be smiling and smiled upon, hiding her existence in the darkest corner of his heart. But she would mar his pleasure. She would go in her dingy rags, with her faded face, once as handsome as the best, with her little child that had its father's hair and eyes, and disclose herself to the squire as his elder son's wife. 
It is seldom that the miserable can help regarding their misery as a wrong inflicted by those who are less miserable. Molly knew that the cause of her dingy rags was not her husband's neglect, but the demon opium to whom she was enslaved, body and soul, except in the lingering mother's tenderness that refused to give him her hungry child. She knew this well, and yet, in the moments of wretched, unbenumbed consciousness, the sense of her want and degradation transformed itself continually into bitterness towards Godfrey. He was well off, and if she had her rights, she would be well off too. The belief that he repented his marriage and suffered from it only aggravated her vindictiveness. She had set out at an early hour, but had lingered on the road, inclined, by her indolence, to believe that if she waited under the warm shed, the snow would cease to fall. She had waited longer than she knew, and now that she found herself belated in the snow-hidden ruggedness of the long lanes, even the animation of a vindictive purpose could not keep her spirit from failing. It was seven o'clock, and by this time she was not very far from Ravelow, but she was not familiar enough with those monotonous lanes to know how near she was to her journey's end. She needed comfort, and she knew but one comforter, the familiar demon in her bosom. But she hesitated for a moment, after drawing out the black remnant, before she raised it to her lips. In that moment the mother's love pleaded for painful consciousness rather than oblivion, pleaded to be left in aching weariness rather than to have the encircling arms benumbed so that they could not feel the dear burden. In another moment Molly had flung something away, but it was not the black remnant, it was an empty phial. And she walked on again under the breaking cloud, from which there came now and then the light of a quickly veiled star, for a freezing wind had sprung up since the snowing had ceased. But she walked always more and more drowsily, and clutched more and more automatically the sleeping child at her bosom. Slowly the demon was working his will, and cold and weariness were his helpers. Soon she felt nothing. She sank down against a straggling furze bush, an easy pillow enough, and the bed of snow, too, was soft. She did not feel that the bed was cold, and did not heed whether the child would wake and cry for her. The complete torpor came at last. The fingers lost their tension, the arms unbent. Then the little head fell away from the bosom, and the blue eyes opened wide on the cold starlight. At first there was a little peevish cry of, Mammy, and an effort to regain the pillowing arm and bosom. But Mammy's ear was deaf, and the pillow seemed to be slipping away backward. Suddenly, as the child rolled downward on its mother's knees, all wet with snow, its eyes were caught by a bright, glancing light on the white ground. The light came from a very bright place, and the little one, rising on its legs, toddled through the snow, the old grimy shawl in which it was wrapped trailing behind it, and the queer little bonnet dangling at its back. Toddled on to the open door of Silas Marner's cottage, and right up to the warm hearth, where there was a bright fire of logs and sticks, which had thoroughly warmed the old sack, Silas's greatcoat, spread out on the bricks to dry. The little one, accustomed to being left to itself for long hours, without notice from its mother, squatted down on the sack, and spread its tiny hands towards the blaze, in perfect contentment, gurgling and making many inarticulate communications to the cheerful fire, like a new-hatched gosling beginning to find itself comfortable. But presently the warmth had a lulling effect, and the little golden head sank down on the old sack, and the blue eyes were veiled by their delicate, half-transparent lids. But where was Silas Marner while this strange visitor had come to his hearth? He was in the cottage, but he did not see the child. During the last few weeks, since he had lost his money, he had contracted the habit of opening his door and looking out from time to time, as if he thought that his money might be somehow coming back to him, or that some trace, some news of it, might be mysteriously on the road, and be caught by the listening ear or the straining eye. It was chiefly at night, when he was not occupied in his loom, 
that he fell into this repetition of an act for which he could have assigned no definite purpose, and which can hardly be understood except by those who have undergone a bewildering separation from a supremely loved object. In the evening twilight, and later, whenever the night was not dark, Silas looked out on that narrow prospect round the stone pits, listening and gazing, not with hope, but with mere yearning and unrest. This morning he had been told by some of his neighbours that it was New Year's Eve, and that he must sit up and hear the old year rung out and the new rung in, because that was good luck and might bring his money back again. This was only a friendly raveller way of jesting with the old, half-crazy oddities of a miser, but it had perhaps helped to throw Silas into a more than usually excited state. Since the oncoming of twilight, he had opened his door again and again, though only to shut it immediately at seeing all distance veiled by the falling snow. But the last time he opened it, the snow had ceased, and the clouds were parting here and there. He stood and listened and gazed for a long while. There was really something on the road coming towards him then, but he caught no sign of it, and the stillness and the wide, trackless snow seemed to narrow his solitude and touched his yearning with a chill of despair. He went in again, and put his right hand on the latch of the door to close it, but he did not close it. He was arrested, as he had been already since his loss, by the invisible wand of catalepsy, and stood like a graven image with wide but sightless eyes, holding open his door, powerless to resist either the good or evil that might enter there. When Marna's sensibility returned, he continued the action which had been arrested and closed his door, unaware of the chasm in his consciousness, unaware of any intermediate change, except that the light had grown dim and that he was chilled and faint. He thought he had been too long standing at the door and looking out. Turning towards the hearth, where the two logs had fallen apart and sent forth only a red, uncertain glimmer, he seated himself on his far-side chair and was stooping to push his logs together when, to his blurred vision, it seemed as if there was gold on the floor in front of the hearth. Gold, his own gold, brought back to him as mysteriously as it had been taken away. He felt his heart begin to beat violently, and for a few moments he was unable to stretch out his hand and grasp the restored treasure. The heap of gold seemed to glow and get larger beneath his agitated gaze. He leaned forward at last and stretched forth his hand, but instead of hard coin with a familiar resisting outline, his fingers encountered soft, warm curls. In utter amazement, Silas fell on his knees and bent his head low to examine the marvel. It was a sleeping child, a round, fair thing with soft yellow rings all over its head. Could this be his little sister, come back to him in a dream? His little sister whom he had carried about in his arms for a year before she died, when he was a small boy without shoes or stockings. That was the first thought that darted across Silas's blank wonderment. Was it a dream? He rose to his feet again, pushed his logs together, and throwing on some dried leaves and sticks, raised a flame. But the flame did not disperse the vision. It only lit up more distinctly the little round form of the child and its shabby clothing. It was very much like his little sister. Silas sank into his chair, powerless, under the double presence of an inexplicable surprise and a hurrying influx of memories. How and when had the child come in without his knowledge? He had never been beyond the door. But along with that question, and almost thrusting it away, there was a vision of the old home and the old streets leading to Lantern Yard, and within that vision another of the thoughts which had been present with him in those far-off scenes. The thoughts were strange to him now, like old friendships impossible to revive, and yet he had a dreamy feeling that this child was somehow a message come to him from that far-off life, 
It stirred fibres that had never been moved in Ravelot, old quiverings of tenderness, old impressions of awe at the presentiment of some power presiding over his life, for his imagination had not yet extricated itself from the sense of mystery in the child's sudden presence, and had formed no conjectures of ordinary natural means by which the event could have been brought about. But there was a cry on the hearth. The child had awaked, and Marna stooped to lift it on his knee. It clung round his neck and burst louder and louder into that mingling of inarticulate cries with Mammy, by which little children express the bewilderment of waking. Silas pressed it to him, and almost unconsciously uttered sounds of hushing tenderness, while he bethought himself that some of his porridge, which had got cool by the dying fire, would do to feed the child with if it were only warmed up a little. He had plenty to do through the next hour. The porridge, sweetened with some dry brown sugar from an old store which he had refrained from using for himself, stopped the cries of the little one and made her lift her blue eyes with a wide, quiet gaze at Silas as he put the spoon into her mouth. Presently she slipped from his knee and began to toddle about, but with a pretty stagger that made Silas jump up and follow her lest she should fall against anything that would hurt her but she only fell in a sitting posture on the ground and began to pull at her boots, looking up at him with a crying face as if the boots hurt her. He took her on his knee again, but it was some time before it occurred to Silas's dull, bachelor mind that the wet boots were the grievance, pressing on her warm ankles. He got them off with difficulty, and Baby was at once happily occupied with the primary mystery of her own toes, inviting Silas, with much chuckling, to consider the mystery too. But the wet boots had at last suggested to Silas that the child had been walking on the snow, and this roused him from his entire oblivion of any ordinary means by which it could have entered or been brought into his house. Under the prompting of this new idea, and without waiting to form conjectures, he raised the child in his arms and went to the door. As soon as he had opened it, there was the cry of Mammy again, which Silas had not heard since the child's first hungry waking. Bending forward, he could just discern the marks made by the little feet on the virgin snow, and he followed their track to the first bushes. Mammy! the little one cried again and again, stretching itself forward so as almost to escape from Silas's arms, before he himself was aware that there was something more than the bush before him, that there was a human body with the head sunk low in the furs and half covered with the shaken snow. It was after the early supper time at the Red House, and the entertainment was in that stage when bashfulness itself had passed into easy jollity, when gentlemen, conscious of unusual accomplishments, could at length be prevailed upon to dance a hornpipe, and when the squire preferred talking loudly, scattering snuff and patting his visitors' backs to sitting longer at the whist table. There were two doors by which the white parlour was entered from the hall, and they were both standing open for the sake of air, but the lower one was crowded with the servants and villagers, and only the upper doorway was left free. Godfrey was standing a little way off to keep sight of Nancy, who was seated in a group near her father. He stood aloof because he wished to avoid suggesting himself as a subject of the squire's fatherly jokes in connection with matrimony and Miss Nancy Lameter's beauty, which were likely to become more and more explicit. But he had the prospect of dancing with her again when the hornpipe was concluded, and in the meanwhile it was very pleasant to get long glances at her, quite unobserved. But when Godfrey was lifting his eyes from one of those long glances, they encountered an object as startling to him at that moment as if it had been an apparition from the dead. It was his own child, carried in Silas Marner's arms. Mr. Crackenthorpe, the rector, and Mr. Lameter had already advanced to Silas in astonishment at this strange advent. Godfrey joined them immediately, unable to rest without hearing every word, trying to control himself, but conscious that if anyone noticed him, they must see that he was white-lipped and trembling. But now all eyes at the end of the room were bent on Silas Marner. The squire himself had risen and asked angrily, How's this? What's this? 
What do you do coming in here in this way? I'm come for the doctor. I want the doctor, Silas had said in the first moment to Mr. Crackenthorpe. Why, what's the matter, Marna? said the rector. The doctor's here, but say quietly what you want him for. It's a woman, said Silas, speaking low and half breathlessly, just as Godfrey came up. She's dead, I think, dead in the snow at the storm pits, not far from my door. Godfrey felt a great throb. There was one terror in his mind at that moment. It was that the woman might not be dead. Hush, hush, said Mr. Crackenthorpe. Go out into the hall there. I'll fetch the doctor to you. Found a woman in the snow. Thinks she's dead, he added, speaking low to the squire. Better say as little about it as possible. It'll shock the ladies. Just tell them a poor woman is ill from cold and hunger. I'll go and fetch Kimball. By this time, however, the ladies had pressed forward. What child is this? said several ladies at once, and among the rest, Nancy Lameter addressing Godfrey. I don't know. Some poor woman's who's been found in the snow, I believe, was the answer Godfrey wrung from himself with a terrible effort. Why, you'd better leave the child here then, Master Marner, said good-natured Mrs. Kimball. No. No, I can't part with it. I can't let it go, said Silas, abruptly. It's come to me. I've a right to keep it. The proposition to take the child from him had come to Silas quite unexpectedly, and his speech, uttered under a strong, sudden impulse, was almost like a revelation to himself. A minute before, he had no distinct intention about the child. Did you ever hear the like? said Mrs. Kimball, in mild surprise to her neighbour. Now, ladies, I must trouble you to stand aside, said Mr. Kimball, coming from the card room. He hastened out with Marna, followed by Mr. Crackenthorpe and Godfrey. Get me a pair of thick boots, Godfrey, will you? And stay. Let somebody run to Winthrop's and fetch Dolly. She's the best woman to get. Ben was here himself before supper. Is he gone? Yes, sir, I met him, said Marna. But I couldn't stop to tell him anything. Only I said I was going for the doctor, and he said the doctor was at the squire's, and I made haste and ran, and there was nobody to be seen at the back of the house, so I went in to where the company was. The child, no longer distracted by the bright light and the smiling women's faces, began to cry and call for Mammy, though always clinging to Marna, who had apparently won her thorough confidence. Godfrey had come back with the boots, and felt the cry as if some fibre were drawn tight within him. I'll go, he said hastily, eager for some movement. I'll go and fetch the woman, Mrs. Winthrop. In a few minutes he was on his rapid way to the stone pits by the side of Dolly. You'd a deal better go back, sir, said Dolly, with respectful compassion. You've no call to catch cold. No, I'll stay, now I'm once out. I'll stay outside here, said Godfrey, when they came opposite Marner's cottage. You can come and tell me if I can do anything. Well, sir, you're very good. You've a tender heart, said Dolly, going to the door. Godfrey was too painfully preoccupied to feel a twinge of self-reproach at this undeserved praise. He walked up and down, unconscious that he was plunging ankle-deep in snow, unconscious of everything but the trembling suspense about what was going on in the cottage into which his wife had been taken. Is she dead? said the voice that predominated over every other within him. If she is, I may marry Nancy, and then I shall be a good fellow in the future, and have no secrets, and the child shall be taken care of somehow. But across that vision came the other possibility. She may live, and then it's all up with me. Godfrey never knew how long it was before the door of the cottage opened and Mr. Kimball came out. He went forward to meet his uncle, prepared to suppress the agitation he must feel, whatever news he was to hear. I waited for you as I'd come so far, he said, speaking first. Pooh, it was nonsense for you to come out. Why didn't you send one of the men? There's nothing to be done. She's dead. Has been dead for hours, I should say. Dr. Kimball went on, and Godfrey turned back to the cottage. He cast only one glance at the dead face on the pillow, which Dolly had smoothed with decent care, but he remembered that last look at his unhappy, hated wife so well 
that at the end of sixteen years every line in the worn face was present to him when he told the full story of this night. He turned immediately towards the hearth where Silas Marner sat lulling the child. You'll take the child to the parish tomorrow, asked Godfrey, speaking as indifferently as he could. Who says so? said Marner sharply. Will they make me take her? Why, well, you wouldn't like to keep her, should you? An old bachelor like you? Till anybody shows me they've a right to take her away from me, said Marner. The mother's dead, and I reckon it's got no father. It's a lone thing, and I'm a lone thing. My money's gone, I don't know where. And this has come from I don't know where. I know nothing. I'm partly amazed. Poor little thing, said Godfrey. Let me give you something towards finding it clothes. He had put his hand in his pocket and found half a guinea, and thrusting it into Silas's hand, he hurried out of the cottage. Godfrey reappeared in the white parlour with a sense of relief and gladness that was too strong for painful thoughts to struggle with. For could he not venture now, whenever opportunity offered, to say the tenderest things to Nancy Lameter, to promise her and himself that he would always be just what she would desire to see him? There was no danger that his dead wife would be recognised. Those were not days of active inquiry and wide report. And as for the registry of their marriage, that was a long way off, buried in unturned pages, away from everyone's interest but his own. Dunsey might betray him if he came back, but Dunsey might be one to silence. There was a pauper's burial that week in Ravelow, and that was all the note taken that Molly Cass had disappeared from the eyes of men. Silas Marner's determination to keep the tramp's child was matter of hardly less surprise and iterated talk in the village than the robbery of his money. That softening of feeling towards him, which dated from his misfortune, that merging of suspicion and dislike in a rather contemptuous pity for him as lone and crazy, was now accompanied with a more active sympathy, especially amongst the women. Notable mothers, who knew what it was to keep children whole and sweet. Lazy mothers, who knew what it was to be interrupted in folding their arms and scratching their elbows by the mischievous propensities of children just firm on their legs, were equally interested in conjecturing how a lone man would manage with a two-year-old child on his hands, and were equally ready with their suggestions. The notable chiefly telling him what he had better do, and the lazy ones being emphatic in telling him what he would never be able to do. Among the notable mothers, Dolly Winthrop was the one whose neighbourly offices were the most acceptable to Marna, for they were rendered without any show of bustling instruction. Silas had shown her the half guinea given to him by Godfrey, and asked her what he should do about getting some clothes for the child. Eh, hey, Master Marna, said Dolly, there's no call to buy no more nor a pair of shoes, for I've got the little petticoats my youngest boy Aaron wore five years ago, and is ill spending the money on them baby clothes, for the child will grow like grass in May, bless it, that it will. And the same day Dolly brought her bundle, and displayed to Marna, one by one, the tiny garments in their due order of succession, most of them patched and darned, but clean and neat as fresh-sprung herbs. This was the introduction to a great ceremony with soap and water, from which Baby came out in a new beauty and sat on Dolly's knee, handling her toes and chuckling and patting her palms together with an air of having made several discoveries about herself, which she communicated by alternate sounds of gug, gug, gug and mammy. The mammy was not a cry of need or uneasiness. Baby had been used to utter it without expecting either tender sound or touch to follow. Anybody would think the angels in heaven couldn't be prettier, said Dolly, rubbing the golden curls and kissing them. And to think of its being covered with them dirty rags, and the poor mother froze to death. But there's them as took care of it and brought it to your door, Master Marna. The door was open, and it walked in over the snow, like as if it had been a little starved robin. Didn't you say the door was open? 
Yes, said Silas, meditatively. Yes, the door was open. The money's gone, I don't know where. And this is come from I don't know where. He had not mentioned to anyone his unconsciousness of the child's entrance, shrinking from questions which might lead to the fact he himself suspected, namely, that he had been in one of his trances. Ah, said Dolly, with soothing gravity, it's like the night and the morning, and the sleeping and the waking, and the rain and the harvest. One goes and the other comes, and we know nothing how nor where. We may strive and scrat and fend, but it's little we can do after all. The big things come and go with no striving of our own. They do that they do. And I think you're in the right on it to keep the little un, Master Marner, seeing as it's been sent to you, though there's folks as think different. You'll happen to be a bit moithered with it while you're so little, but I'll come and welcome and see to it for you. I've a bit of time to spare most days. For when one gets up a time in the morning, the clock seems to stand still toward ten, afore it's time to go about the victuals. So, as I say, I'll come and see to the child for you, and welcome. Thank you, kindly, said Silas, hesitating a little. I'll be glad if you tell me things, but, he added uneasily, leaning forward to look at Baby with some jealousy, as she was resting her head backward against Dolly's arm and eyeing him contentedly from a distance. But I want to do things for it myself, else it may get fond of somebody else, and not fond of me. I've been used to fending for myself in the house. I can learn, I can learn. Eh, to be sure, said Dolly gently. I've seen men as a wonderful handy with children. The men are awkward and contrary mostly, God help them. But when the drink's out of them, they aren't unsensible, though they're bad for leeching and bandaging, so fiery and impatient. You should see this goes first, next the skin proceeded Dolly, taking up the little shirt and putting it on. Yes, said Marna, docilely, bringing his eyes very close, that they might be initiated in the mysteries, whereupon Baby seized his head with both her small arms and put her lips against his face with purring noises. See there, said Dolly, with a woman's tender tact. She's fondest of you. She wants to go a your lap, I'll be bound. Go then. Take her, Master Marner. You can put the things on, and then you can say as you've done for her from the first of her coming to you. Marner took her on his lap, trembling with an emotion mysterious to himself, at something unknown dawning on his life. Thought and feeling were so confused within him that if he had tried to give them utterance, he could only have said that the child was come instead of the gold, that the gold had turned into the child. He took the garments from Dolly and put them on under her teaching, interrupted, of course, by baby's gymnastics. There, then, why, you take to it quite easy, Master Marner, said Dolly. But what shall you do when you're first to sit at your loom? For she'll get busier and mischievouser every day, she will, bless her. It's lucky as you've got that high hearth instead of a grate, for that keeps the fire more out of her reach. But if you've got anything as can be spilt or broke, or as is fit to cut her fingers off, she'll be at it, and it is but right you should know. Silas meditated a little while, in some perplexity. I'll tie her to the leg of the loom, he said at last. Tie her with a good long strip or something. Well, mayhap that'll do, as it's a little girl, for they're easier persuaded to sit in one place nor the lads. I know what the lads are, for I've had four. Four I've had, God knows. And if you was to take and tie em up, they'd make a fightin' and a cryin' as if you were ringing the pigs. But I'll bring you my little chair, and some bits of red rag, and things for her to play with, and she'll sit and chatter to em as if they were alive. If it wasn't a sin to the lads to wish em me different, bless em, I should have been glad for one of em to be a little girl, and to think as I could have taught her to scour, and mend, and the knitting, and everything. But I can teach him this little un, Master Marner, when she gets old enough. But she'll be my little un, said Marner, rather hastily. She'll be nobody else's. No, to be sure, you'll have a right to her, if you're a father to her, and bring her up according. But, added Dolly, coming to a point which she had determined beforehand to touch upon, you must bring her up like christened folks' children, and take her to church. And let her learn her catechise, as my little Aaron can say off the I believe and everything, and hurt nobody by word or deed. 
as well as if he was the clerk. That's what you must do, Master Manor, if you do the right thing by the orphan child. Manor's pale face flushed suddenly under a new anxiety. His mind was too busy trying to give some definite bearing to Dolly's words for him to think of answering her. And it's my belief, she went on, as the poor little creature has never been christened, and it's nothing but right as the parson should be spoke to, and if you was no ways unwilling, I'll talk to Mr Macy about it this very day. For if the child ever went any ways wrong, and you hadn't done your part by it, Master Marner, inoculation, and everything to save it from harm, it'd be a thorn in your bed forever of this side of the grave, and I can't think as this would be easy lying down for anybody when they'd got to another world if they hadn't done their part by the helpless children as come we out their own asking. Dolly herself was disposed to be silent for some time now, for she had spoken from the depth of her own simple belief, and was much concerned to know whether her words would produce the desired effect on Silas. He was puzzled and anxious, for Dolly's word, christened, conveyed no distinct meaning to him. He had only heard of baptism, and had only seen the baptism of grown men and women. "'What is it you mean by christened?' he said at last, timidly. "'Won't folks be good to her without it?' "'Dear, dear Master Marner,' said Dolly, with gentle distress and compassion, "'had you never no father nor mother has taught you to say your prayers, "'and as there's good words and good things to keep us from harm?' "'Yes,' said Silas, in a low voice. "'I know a deal about that. Used to, used to. "'But your ways are different. My country was a good way off.' He paused a few moments, and then added, more decidedly, "'But I want to do everything as can be done for the child, "'and whatever's right for it in this country, "'and you think will do it good. "'I'll act according, if you'll tell me.' "'Well then, Master Marner,' said Dolly, inwardly rejoiced, "'I'll ask Mr Macy to speak to the parson about it, "'and you must fix on a name for it, "'because it must have a name given it when it's christened.' "'My mother's name was Hepzibah said Silas, and my little sister was named after her. Well, that's a hard name, said Dolly. I partly think it isn't a christened name. It's a Bible name, said Silas, old ideas recurring. Then I've no call to speak again it, said Dolly, rather startled by Silas's knowledge on this head. But you see, I'm no scholar, and I'm slow at catching the words. My husband says I'm all as like as if I was put in the half for the handle. That's what he says, for he's very sharp, God help him. But it was awkward calling your sister by such a hard name, wasn't it, Master Marner? We called her Epi, said Silas. Well, if it was no ways wrong to shorten the name, it'd be a deal handier. And so I'll go now, Master Marner, and I'll speak about the christening afore dark, and I wish you the best of luck. And it's my belief as it'll come to you, if you do what's right by the orphan child. And there's an occulation to be seen to. And as to washing its bits of things, you need look to nobody but me. For I can do them with one hand when I've got my suds about. Wah, well, the blessed angel. You'll let me bring my heir in one of these days, and he'll show her his little cart as his father's made for him, and the black and white pup he's got a rear in. Baby was christened the rector deciding that a double baptism was the lesser risk to incur. And on this occasion, Silas, making himself as clean and tidy as he could, appeared for the first time within the church and shared in the observances held sacred by his neighbours. He was quite unable, by means of anything he heard or saw, to identify the Ravelo religion with his old faith. If he could at any time in his previous life had done so, it must have been by the aid of a strong feeling, ready to vibrate with sympathy, rather than by a comparison of phrases and ideas, and now for long years that feeling had been dormant. He had no distinct idea about the baptism and the church-going, except that Dolly had said it was for the good of the child, and in this way, as the weeks grew to months, the child created fresh links between his life and the lives from which he had hitherto shrunk continually into narrower isolation. 
Unlike the gold, which needed nothing, and must be worshipped in close-locked solitude, which was hidden away from daylight, was deaf to the song of birds, and started to know human tones, Epi was a creature of endless claims and ever-growing desires, seeking and loving sunshine and living sounds and living moments, making trial of everything with trust in new joy and stirring the human kindness in all eyes that looked on her. The gold had kept his thoughts in an ever-repeated circle, leading to nothing beyond itself. But Epi was an object compacted of changes and hopes that forced his thoughts onward and carried them far away from their old eager pacing towards the same blank limit, carried them away to the new things that would come with the coming years, when Epi would have learned to understand how her father Silas cared for her and made him look for images of that time in the ties and charities that bound together the families of his neighbours. The gold had asked that he should sit weaving longer and longer, deafened and blinded more and more to all things except the monotony of his loom and the repetition of his web. But Epi called him away from his weaving and made him think all its pauses a holiday, reawakening his senses with her fresh life, even to the old winter flies that came crawling forth in the early spring sunshine and warming him into joy because she had joy. And when the sunshine grew strong and lasting, so that the buttercups were thick in the meadows, Silas might be seen in the sunny midday or in the late afternoon, when the shadows were lengthening under the hedgerows, strolling out with uncovered head to carry Epi beyond the stone pits to where the flowers grew, till they reached some favourite bank where he could sit down, while Epi toddled to pluck the flowers and make remarks to the winged things that murmured happily above the bright petals, calling Dad-Dad's attention continually by bringing him the flowers. Then she would turn her ear to some sudden bird note, and Silas learned to please her by making signs of hushed stillness that they might listen for the note to come again. So that when it came, she set up her small back and laughed with gurgling triumph. Sitting on the banks in this way, Silas began to look for the once familiar herbs again, and as the leaves, with their unchanged outline and markings, lay on his palm, there was a sense of crowding remembrances from which he turned away timidly, taking refuge in Epi's little world that lay lightly on his enfeebled spirit. As the child's mind was growing into knowledge, his mind was growing into memory, as her life unfolded, his soul, long stupefied in a cold, narrow prison, was unfolding too and trembling gradually into full consciousness. It was an influence which must gather force with every new year. The tones that stirred Silas's heart grew articulate and called for more distinct answers. Shapes and sounds grew clearer for Epi's eyes and ears. And there was more that Dad Dad was imperatively required to notice and account for. Also, by the time Epi was three years old, she developed a fine capacity for mischief and for devising ingenious ways of being troublesome, which found much exercise not only for Silas's patience, but for his watchfulness and penetration. Sorely was poor Silas puzzled on such occasions by the incompatible demands of love. Dolly Winthrop told him that punishment was good for Epi, and that, as for rearing a child without making it tingle a little in soft and safe places now and then, it was not to be done. To be sure, there's another thing you might do, Master Marner, added Dolly meditatively. You might shut her up once in the coal hole. That's what I did with Aaron, for I were that silly with the youngest lad as I could never bear to smack him. Not as I could find him he art to let him stay the coal hole more nor a minute, but it was enough to collie him all over, so as he must be new washed and dressed, and it was as good as a rod to him, that was. But I put it upo your conscience, Master Marner, as as one of em you must choose, either smacking or the coal hole, else she'll get so masterful there'll be no holding her. Silas was impressed with the melancholy truth of this last remark, but his force of mind failed before the only two penal methods open to him, not only because it was painful to him to hurt Epi, but because he trembled at a moment's contention with her, lest she should love him the less for it. 
Let even an affectionate Goliath get himself tied to a small, tender thing, dreading to hurt it by pulling, and dreading still more to snap the cord, and which of the two, pray, will be master? It was clear that Epi, with her short, toddling steps, must lead Father Silas a pretty dance on any fine morning when circumstances favoured mischief. Notwithstanding the difficulty of carrying her and his yarn or linen at the same time, Silas took her with him in most of his journeys to the farmhouses, unwilling to leave her behind at Dolly Winthrop's, who was always ready to take care of her. And little curly-headed Epi, the weaver's child, became an object of interest at several outlying homesteads, as well as in the village. Hitherto he had been treated very much as if he had been a useful gnome or brownie, a queer and unaccountable creature who must necessarily be looked at with wondering curiosity and repulsion, and with whom one would be glad to make all greetings and bargains as brief as possible, but who must be dealt with in a propitiatory way, and occasionally have a present of pork or garden stuff to carry home with him, seeing that without him there was no getting the yarn woven. But now Silas met with open, smiling faces and cheerful questioning as a person whose satisfactions and difficulties could be understood. Everywhere he must sit a little and talk about the child, and words of interest were always ready for him. Ah, oh, Master Marner, you'll be lucky if she takes the measles soon and easy. Or, why, there isn't many lone men had been wishing to take up with a little one like that. But I reckon the weaving makes you handier than men as do outdoor work. You're partly as handy as a woman, for weaving comes next to spinning. Elderly masters and mistresses, seated observantly in large kitchen armchairs, shook their heads over the difficulties attendant on rearing children, felt Epi's round arms and legs, and pronounced them remarkably firm, and told Silas that, if she turned out well, which, however, there was no telling, it would be a fine thing for him to have a steady lass to do for him when he got helpless. Servant maidens were fond of carrying her out to look at the hens and chickens, or to see if any cherries could be shaken down in the orchard, and the small boys and girls approached her slowly, with cautious movement and steady gaze, like little dogs face to face with one of their own kind, till attraction had reached the point at which the soft lips were put out for a kiss. No child was afraid of approaching Silas when Epi was near him. There was no repulsion around him now, either for young or old, for the little child had come to link him once more with the whole world. There was love between him and the child that blent them into one. The disposition to hoard had been utterly crushed at the very first by the loss of his long-stored gold. And now something had come to replace his hoard, which gave a growing purpose to his earnings, drawing his hope and joy continually onward beyond the money. In old days there were angels who came and took men by the hand and led them away from the city of destruction. We see no white-winged angels now, but yet men are led away from threatening destruction, a hand is put into theirs, which leads them forth gently towards a calm and bright land, so that they look no more backward, and the hand may be a little child's. There was one person, as you will believe, who watched with keener, though more hidden interest than any other, the prosperous growth of Epi under the weaver's care. Was he very uneasy at his inability to give his daughter her birthright? I cannot say that he was. The child was being taken care of, and would very likely be happy, as people in humble stations often were, happier, perhaps, than those who are brought up in luxury. Meanwhile, no Dunsey had come back. People had made up their minds that he was gone for a soldier, or gone out of the country, and no one cared to be specific in their inquiries on a subject delicate to a respectable family. Godfrey had ceased to see the shadow of Dunsey across his path, and the path now lay straight forward to the accomplishment of his best, longest cherished wishes. Everybody said Mr. Godfrey had taken the right turn, and it was pretty clear what would be the end of things. Godfrey himself, when he was asked jocosely if the day had been fixed, 
smiled with a pleasant consciousness of a lover who could say yes if he liked. He felt a reformed man, delivered from temptation, and the vision of his future life seemed to him as a promised land for which he had no cause to fight. He saw himself with all his happiness centred on his own half, while Nancy would smile on him as he played with the children. And that other child, not on the half, he would not forget it, he would see that it was well provided for, that was a father's duty. It was a bright autumn Sunday, sixteen years after Silas Marner had found his new treasure on the hearth. The bells of the old Ravelo church were ringing the cheerful peal which told that the morning service was ended. It is impossible to mistake Silas Marner among the departing congregation. His large brown eyes seem to have gathered a longer vision, as is the way with eyes that have been short-sighted in early life, and they have a less vague, a more answering gaze, but in everything else one sees signs of a frame much enfeebled by the lapse of the sixteen years. The weaver's bent shoulders and white hair give him almost the look of advanced age, though he's not more than five and fifty. But there is the freshest blossom of youth close by his side, a blonde, dimpled girl of eighteen, who has vainly tried to chastise her curly auburn hair into smoothness under her brown bonnet. That good-looking young fellow in a new fustian suit who walks behind her is Aaron Winthrop. Eppy surely divines that there is someone behind her who is thinking about her very particularly and mustering courage to come to her side as soon as they are out in the lane. Else why should she look rather shy and take care not to turn away her head from her father, Silas, to whom she keeps murmuring little sentences as to who was at church and who was not at church, and how pretty the red mountain ash is over the rectory wall. I wish we had a little garden, father, with double daisies in it, like Mrs. Winthrop's, said Eppie, when they were out in the lane. Only they say to take a deal of digging. I could do it, child, if you want a bit of garden. I can dig it for you, Master Marner, said the young man in fustian, who was now by Eppie's side, entering into the conversation without the trouble of formalities. Eh, hey, Aaron, my lad, are you there? said Silas. I wasn't aware of you, for when Eppie's talking of things, I say nothing but what she's a saying. Well, if you could help me with the digging, we might get her a bit of garden all the sooner. Then, if you will think well and good, said Aaron, I'll come to the stone pits this afternoon, and we'll settle what land's to be taken in, and I'll get up an hour earlier in the morning and begin on it. Well, said Silas gravely, so as you don't make free for us, or ask for anything as is worth much at the Red House, for Mr Cass has been so good to us, and built us up a new end of the cottage, and given us beds and things, as I couldn't abide to be imposing for garden stuff or anything else. No, no, there's no imposing, said Aaron. There's never a garden in all the parish, but what there's endless waste in it, for want of somebody as could use everything up. But I must go back now, else mother'll be in trouble as I aren't there. Bring her with you this afternoon, Aaron, said Eppie. I shouldn't like to fix about the garden, and her not know everything from the first. Should you, father? I bring her if you can, Aaron, said Silas. She's sure to have a word to say as'll help us to set things on the right end. Aaron turned back up the village while Silas and Eppie went on up the lonely, sheltered lane. Oh, Daddy, she began, when they were in privacy, clasping and squeezing Silas's arm, and skipping round to give him an energetic kiss. My little old Daddy, I'm so glad. I don't think I shall want anything else when we've got a little garden. And I knew Aaron would dig it for us, she went on with roguish triumph. I knew that very well. You're a deep little puss you are, said Silas with a mild, passive happiness of love-crowned age in his face. But you'll make yourself fine and beholden to Aaron. Oh, no, I shan't, said Eppie, laughing and frisking. He likes it. Eppie skipped forward to the pit to look for stones to begin her garden walk, but she started back in surprise. Oh, father, just come and look here, she exclaimed. Come and see how the water's gone down since yesterday. Why, well, yesterday the pit was ever so full. Well, to be sure, said Silas, coming to her side. Why, that's the draining they've begun on, since harvest, in Mr. Osgood's fields, I reckon. The foreman said to me the other day when I passed by him, 
Master Marner, he said, I shouldn't wonder if we lay your bitter waste as dry as a bone. It was Mr. Godfrey Cass, he said, had gone into the draining. He's been taking these fields of Mr. Osgood. How odd it'll seem to have the old pit dried up, said Eppie, turning away and stooping to lift a rather large stone. Now you're fine and strong, are you? said Silas, while Eppie shook her aching arms and laughed. Come, come, let's go and sit down on the bank against the stile there and have no more lifting. You might hurt yourself, child. You'd need to have somebody to work for you, and my arm isn't over strong. Silas uttered the last sentence slowly, as if it implied more than met the ear. And Eppie, when they sat down on the bank, nestled close to his side, and taking hold caressingly of the arm that was not over strong, held it on her lap, while Silas puffed again dutifully at the pipe which occupied his other arm. An ash in the hedgerow behind made a fretted screen from the sun and threw happy, playful shadows all about them. Father, said Eppie, very gently, after they had been sitting in silence a little while, if I was to be married, ought I to be married with my mother's ring? Silas gave an almost imperceptible start, though the question fell in with the undercurrent of thought in his own mind, and then said in a subdued tone, Why, Eppie, have you been a-thinking on it? Only this last week, father, said Eppie ingenuously, since Aaron talked to me about it. And what do you say, said Silas, still in the same subdued way, as if he were anxious lest he should fall into the slightest tone that was not for Eppie's good. He said he should like to be married, because he was a-going in four and twenty, and he got a deal of gardening work, now Mr. Mott's given up, and he goes twice a week regular to Mr. Cass's, and once to Mr. Osgood's, and they're going to take him on at the rectory. And who is it he's a-wanting to marry? said Silas, with rather a sad smile. Why, me, to be sure, Daddy, said Eppie, with dimpling laughter, kissing her father's cheek, as if he'd want to marry anybody else. And you mean to have him, do you? said Silas. Yes, sometime, said Eppie. I don't know when. Everybody's married sometime, Aaron says. But I told him that wasn't true, for I said, look at father, he's never been married. No, child, said Silas. Your father was a lone man till you were sent to him. But you'll never be lone again, father, said Eppie tenderly. That was what Aaron said. I could never think of taking you away from Master Marner, Eppie. And I said it'd be no use if you did, Aaron. And he wants us all to live together. So as you needn't work a bit, Father, only what's for your own pleasure. And he'd be as good as a son to you. That's what he said. And should you like that, Eppie? said Silas, looking at her. I shouldn't mind it, Father, said Eppie, quite simply. And I should like things to be so as you needn't work too much. But if it wasn't for that... I'd sooner things didn't change. I'm very happy. I like Aaron to be fond of me, and come and see us often, and behave pretty to you. He always does behave pretty to you, doesn't he, father? Yes, child. Nobody could behave better, said Silas emphatically. He's his mother's lad. But I don't want any change, said Eppie. I should like to go on a long, long while, just as we are. Only Aaron does want to change, and he made me cry a bit, only a bit, because he said I didn't care for him, for if I cared for him, I should want us to be married as he did. Eh, me blessed child, said Silas, laying down his pipe, as if it were useless to pretend to smoke any longer. You're all young to be married. We'll ask Mrs Winthrop, we'll ask Aaron's mother what she thinks. If there's the right thing to do, she'll come at it. But there's this to be thought on, Eppy. Things will change, whether we like it or no. Things won't go on a long while, just as they are, and no difference. I shall get older, and helplesser, and be a burden on you, belike, if I don't go away from you altogether. Not as I mean you'd think me a burden, I know you wouldn't, but it'd be hard upon you, and when I look forward to that, I like to think as you'd have somebody else besides me, somebody young and strong, as'll outlast your own life, and take care on you to the end. Silas paused, and resting his wrists on his knees, lifted his hands up and down meditatively as he looked on the ground. Then would you like me to be married, father? said Eppie, with a little trembling in her voice. I'll not be the man to say no, Eppie, 
said Silas emphatically. But we'll ask your godmother. She'll wish the right thing by you and her son too. There they come then, said Eppie. Let us go and meet them. Oh, the pipe. Won't you have it lit again, father? said Eppie, lifting that medicinal appliance from the ground. Nay, child, said Silas. I've done enough for today. I think, mayhap, a little of it does me more good than so much at once. It was Godfrey Cass's custom on a Sunday afternoon after church to do a little contemplative farming in a leisurely walk. His wife Nancy seldom accompanied him, for the women of her generation were not given to much walking beyond their own house and garden, finding sufficient exercise in domestic duties. So she usually sat with her Bible before her, and after following the text with her eyes for a little while, she would gradually permit them to wander as her thoughts had already insisted on wandering. There was one main thread of painful experience in Nancy's married life. Her deepest wounds had all come from the perception that the absence of children from their hearth was dwelt on in her husband's mind as a privation to which he could not reconcile himself. And always, when Nancy reached this point in her meditations, trying with predetermined sympathy to see everything as Godfrey saw it, there came a renewal of self-questioning. Had she done everything in her power to lighten Godfrey's privation? Had she really been right in the resistance which had cost her so much pain six years ago, and again four years ago, the resistance to her husband's wish that they should adopt a child? Adoption was more remote from the ideas and habits of that time than of our own. Still, Nancy had her opinion on it. To adopt a child, because children of your own had been denied you, was to try and choose your lot in spite of providence. The adopted child, she was convinced, would never turn out well. Godfrey had, from the first, specified Epi, then about twelve years old, as a child suitable for them to adopt. It had never occurred to him that Silas would rather part with his life than with Epi. Surely the weaver would wish the best to the child he had taken so much trouble with, and would be glad that such good fortune should happen to her. It seemed an eminently appropriate thing to Godfrey, for reasons that were known only to himself, and by a common fallacy, he imagined the measure would be easy because he had private motives for desiring it. Godfrey was not insensible to his wife's loving effort, and did Nancy no injustice as to the motives of her obstinacy. It was impossible to have lived with her fifteen years, and not be aware that an unselfish clinging to the right, and a sincerity clear as the flower-born dew, were her main characteristics. On this Sunday afternoon, it was already four years since there had been any allusion to the subject between them, and Nancy supposed that it was forever buried. I wonder if he'll mind it less or more as he gets older, she thought. I'm afraid more. Aged people feel the miss of children, and if I die, Godfrey will be very lonely. The door opened at the other end of the room, and Nancy looked up and saw her husband. She turned to him with gladness in her eyes, but Godfrey was laying down his hat with trembling hands and turned towards her with a pale face and a strange, unanswering glance. Nancy, he said, I came back as soon as I could to hinder anybody's telling you but me. I've had a great shock, but I care most about the shock it'll be to you. It isn't father. No, said Godfrey, it's Dunstan, my brother Dunstan, that we lost sight of sixteen years ago. We found him, found his body, his skeleton. The deep dread Godfrey's look had created in Nancy made her feel those words a relief. She sat in comparative calmness to hear what else he had to tell. He went on. The stone pit has gone dry suddenly from the draining, I suppose, and there he lies, has lain for sixteen years, wedged between two great stones. There's his watch and seals that he wore the last time he was seen. Godfrey paused. It was not so easy to say what came next. Presently, he added, Dunstan was the man that robbed Silas Marner. The blood rushed to Nancy's face and neck at this surprise and shame. Oh, Godfrey, she said, with compassion in her tone. There was the money in the pit, 
he continued, all the weaver's money. Everything's been gathered up and they're taking the skeleton to the rainbow. But I came back to tell you, there was no hindering it, you must know. Godfrey had lifted his eyes to her face and kept them fixed on her as he said, Everything comes to light, Nancy, sooner or later. When God Almighty wills it, our secrets are found out. I have lived with a secret on my mind, but I'll keep it from you no longer. I wouldn't have you know it by somebody else and not by me. Nancy's utmost dread had returned. The eyes of the husband and wife met with awe in them, as at a crisis which suspended affection. Nancy, said Godfrey slowly, when I married you, I hid something from you, something I ought to have told you. That woman Marna found dead in the snow, Epi's mother, that wretched woman was my wife. Epi is my child. Nancy sat quite still, only that her eyes dropped and ceased to meet his. You'll never think the same of me again, said Godfrey, after a little while, with some tremor in his voice. She was silent. I oughtn't to have left the child unowned. I oughtn't to have kept it from you. But I couldn't bear to give you up, Nancy. I was led away into marrying her. I've suffered for it. Still, Nancy was silent, looking down. But at last she lifted up her eyes to his again and spoke. There was no indignation in her voice, only deep regret. Godfrey, if you had but told me this six years ago, we could have done some of our duty by the child. Do you think I'd have refused to take her in if I'd known she was yours? At that moment, Godfrey felt all the bitterness of an error that was not simply futile, but had defeated its own end. He had not measured his wife, with whom he had lived so long, but she spoke again with more agitation. And, oh, Godfrey, if we'd had her from the first, if you'd taken to her as you ought, she'd have loved me for her mother, and you'd have been happier with me, and our life might have been more like what we used to think it had been. The tears fell, and Nancy ceased to speak. I'm a worse man than you thought I was, Nancy, said Godfrey, rather tremulously. Can you forgive me, ever? The wrong to me is but little, Godfrey. You've made it up to me. You've been good to me for fifteen years. It's another you did the wrong to, and I doubt it can never be all made up for. But we can take Epi now, said Godfrey. I won't mind the world knowing at last. I'll be plain and open for the rest of my life. It'll be different coming to us now she's grown up, said Nancy, shaking her head sadly. But it's your duty to acknowledge her and provide for her, and I'll do my part by her and pray to God Almighty to make her love me. Then we'll go together to Silas Marner's this very night, as soon as everything's quiet at the stone pits. Between eight and nine o'clock that evening, Epi and Silas were seated alone in the cottage after the great excitement of the afternoon. On the table near them, lit by a candle, lay the recovered gold, the old long-loved gold, ranged in orderly heaps as Silas used to range it in the days when it was his only joy. He had been telling her how he used to count it every night, and how his soul was utterly desolate till she was sent to him. At that moment, there was a knocking at the door, and Epi stepped to open it. She flushed when she saw Mr. and Mrs. Godfrey Cass. She made her little rustic curtsy, and held the door wide for them to enter. "'Well, Marna,' said Godfrey, trying to speak with perfect firmness, "'it's a great comfort to me to see you with your money again, that you've been deprived of so many years. It was one of my family did you wrong, the more grief to me.' and I feel bound to make up to you for it in every way. Silas, always ill at ease when he was being spoken to by betters, 
answered with some constraint. Sir, I've a deal to thank you for already. As for the robbery, I count it no loss to me. And if I did, you couldn't help it. You aren't answerable for it. You may look at it in that way, Marner, but I never can. And I hope you'll let me act according to my own feeling of what's just. You've done a good part by Eppie for sixteen years. It'd be a great comfort to you to see her well provided for, wouldn't it? You'd like to see her taken care of by those who can leave her well off and make a lady of her. Silas was hurt and uneasy. I don't take your meaning, sir, he answered. Well, my meaning is this, Marner, said Godfrey, determined to come to the point. Mrs. Cass and I, you know, have no children, and we should like to have somebody in the place of a daughter to us. We should like to have Eppy and treat her in every way as our own child. It'd be a great comfort to you in your old age, I hope, to see her fortune made in that way, after you've been at the trouble of bringing her up so well. While Godfrey had been speaking, Eppie had quietly passed her arm behind Silas's head and let her hand rest against it caressingly. She felt him tremble violently. Now Eppie took her hand from her father's head and came forward a step. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. But I can't leave my father, nor own anybody nearer than him. And I don't want to be a lady, thank you all the same. Here, Eppy dropped another curtsy. I couldn't give up the folks I've been used to. Eppy's lip began to tremble a little at the last words. She retreated to her father's chair again, and again put her arm round his neck, while Silas, with a subdued sob, put up his hand to grasp hers. The tears were in Nancy's eyes, but her sympathy with Eppy was, naturally, divided with distress on her husband's account. The agitation with which Godfrey spoke again was not quite unmixed with anger. But I've a claim on you, Eppy, the strongest of all claims. It's my duty, Marna, to own Eppy as my child and provide for her. She's my own child. Her mother was my wife. I've a natural claim on her that must stand before every other. Eppy had given a violent start and turned quite pale. Silas, on the contrary, felt the spirit of resistance in him set free. Then, sir, he answered. Then, sir, why didn't you say so sixteen year ago and claim her before I'd come to love her instead of coming to take her from me now when you might as well take the heart out of my body? God gave her to me because you turned your back upon her and he looks upon her as mine. You've no right to her. When a man turns a blessing from his door, it falls to them as take it in. I know that, Marna, I was wrong. I have repented of my conduct in that matter, said Godfrey, who could not help feeling the edge of Silas's words. I'm glad to hear it, sir, said Marna, with gathering excitement. But repentance doesn't alter what's been going on for sixteen year. Your coming now and saying I'm her father doesn't alter the feelings inside us. It's me she's been calling her father ever since she could say the word. But I think you might look at the thing more reasonably, Marna, said Godfrey, unexpectedly awed by the weaver's direct truth-speaking. It isn't as if she was to be taken quite away from you, so that you'd never see her again. She'll be very near you, and come to see you very often. She'll feel just the same towards you. Just the same, said Marna, more bitterly than ever. How'll she feel just the same for me as she does now, when we eat of the same bit, and drink of the same cup, and think of the same things from one day's end to another, just the same, that's idle talk, you'd cut us in two. Godfrey felt rather angry again. It seemed to him that the weaver was very selfish, a judgment readily passed by those who have never tested their own power of sacrifice, to oppose what was undoubtedly for Eppie's welfare, and he felt himself called upon, for her sake, to assert his authority. I should have thought, Marna, he said severely, I should have thought your affection for Eppie would make you rejoice in what was for her good, even if it did call upon you to give up something. At this, Silas was stricken in conscience. I'll say no more. Let it be as you will. Speak to the child. I'll hinder nothing. Eppie, my dear, said Godfrey, looking at his daughter, not without some embarrassment. 
We hope you'll come to love us, and you'll have the best of mothers in my wife. My dear, you'll be a treasure to me, said Nancy in her gentle voice. Eppy did not come forward and curtsy, as she had done before. She held Silas's hand in hers and grasped it firmly. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir, for your offers. They're very great and far above my wish. For I should have no delight in life any more if I was forced to go away from my father. I knew he was sitting at home a-thinking of me and feeling lone. We've been used to be happy together every day, and I can't think of no happiness without him. And he says he'd nobody in the world till I was sent to him, and he'd have nothing when I was gone. And he's took care of me and loved me from the first, and I'll cleave to him as long as he lives, and nobody shall ever come between him and me. But you must make sure, Eppy, said Silas, in a low voice. You must make sure as you won't ever be sorry. I can never be sorry, father, said Eppy. I should know what to think on or to wish for with fine things about me, as I haven't been used to. And it'd be poor work for me to put on things and ride in a gig and sit in a place at church, as it'd make them as I'm fond of think me unfitting company for em. What could I care for then? Nancy looked at Godfrey with a pained, questioning glance, but his eyes were fixed on the floor. She thought there was a word which might perhaps come better from her lips than from his. What you say is natural, my dear child. It's natural you should cling to those who've brought you up, she said mildly. But there's a duty you owe to your lawful father. I can't feel as if I've got any father but one, said Eppie impetuously, while the tears gathered, and I can't think of no other home. Godfrey looked up at Nancy with a flushed face and smarting, dilated eyes. Let us go, he said. Nancy and Godfrey walked home under the starlight in silence. When they entered the oaken parlour, Godfrey threw himself into his chair, while Nancy laid down her bonnet and shawl and stood on the hearth near her husband. But presently he put out his hand, and as Nancy placed hers within it, he drew her towards him and said, That's ended. She bent to kiss him, and then said, as she stood by his side, Yes, I'm afraid we must give up hope of having her for a daughter. It wouldn't be right to want to force her to come to us against her will. We can't alter her bringing up and what's come of it. No, said Godfrey. There's debts we can't pay like money debts, by paying extra for the years that have slipped by. It's too late now. Marner was in the right in what he said about a man's turning away a blessing from his door. It falls to somebody else. I wanted to pass for childless once, Nancy. I shall pass for childless now, against my wish. Nancy did not speak immediately, but after a little while she asked, You won't make it known, then? about Eppie's being your daughter? No. Where would be the good to anybody? Only harm. Godfrey fell into thoughtfulness again. Presently he looked up at Nancy sorrowfully and said, She's a very pretty, nice girl, isn't she, Nancy? Yes, dear, and with just your hair and eyes. He spoke again after a little while, but the tone was rather changed. There was tenderness mingled with the previous self-reproach. And I got you, Nancy, in spite of it all. And yet I've been grumbling and uneasy because I hadn't something else, as if I deserved it. You've never been wanting to me, Godfrey, said Nancy with quiet sincerity. My trouble would be gone if you resigned yourself to the lot that's been given us. Well, perhaps it isn't too late to mend a bit there. Though it is too late to mend some things, say what they will. The next morning, when Silas and Eppy were seated at their breakfast, he said to her, Eppy, there's a thing I've had on my mind to do this two year, and now the money's been brought back to us, we can do it. I think we'll go while the fine days last. We'll make a little bundle of things and set out. Where to go, Daddy? said Eppy. To my old country to the town where I was born, up Lantern Yard. I want to see my old minister. Something may have come out to make him know I was innocent of the old robbery. 
So, on the fourth day from that time, Silas and Eppy, in their Sunday clothes, with a small bundle tied in a blue linen handkerchief, were making their way through the streets of a great manufacturing town. Silas, bewildered by the changes thirty years had brought over his native place. Oh, what a dark, ugly place, said Eppy. How it hides the sky. How pretty the stone pits will look when we get back. It looks comical to me, child, now, and smells bad. I can't think as it usent to smell so. Here and there a sallow, begrimed face looked out from a gloomy doorway at the strangers and increased Eppy's uneasiness, so that it was a longed-for relief when they issued from the alleys into the entrance to Lantern Yard, where there was a broader strip of sky. Dear heart, said Silas, why, there's people coming out of the yard as if they'd been to chapel at this time of day, a weekday noon. Suddenly he started and stood still, with a look of distressed amazement that alarmed Eppy. They were before an opening in front of a large factory, from which men and women were streaming for their midday meal. Father, said Eppy, clasping his arm, what's the matter? But she had to speak again and again before Silas could answer her. It's gone, child, he said at last, in strong agitation. Lantern Yard's gone, and see that big factory in its place. It's all gone, chapel and all. The old place is all swept away, Silas said to Dolly Winthrop on the night of his return. The little graveyard and everything. The old home's gone. I've no home but this now. I shall never know whether they got at the truth of the robbery. It's dark to me, Mrs. Winthrop, that is. I doubt it'll be dark to the last. Well, yes, Master Marner, said Dolly, who sat with a placid, listening face. I doubt it may. It's the will of them above, as a many things should be dark to us. But there's some things as I've never felt of the dark about, and they're mostly what comes of the day's work. You were hard done by that once, Master Marner, and it seems as you'll never know the rights of it. But that doesn't hinder there being a rights, Master Marner, for all is dark to you and me. No, said Silas. No, that doesn't hinder. Since the time the child was sent to me, and I've come to love her as myself, I've had light enough to trust and buy, and now she says she'll never leave me. I think I shall trust him till I die. There was one time of the year which was held in Ravelow to be especially suitable for a wedding. It was when the great lilacs and laburnums in the old-fashioned gardens showed their golden and purple wealth above the lichen-tinted walls, and when there were calves still young enough to want bucketfuls of fragrant milk. Happily, the sunshine fell more warmly than usual on the lilac tufts the morning that Eppy was married, for her dress was a very light one. She had often thought, though with a feeling of renunciation, that the perfection of a wedding dress would be a white cotton with the tiniest pink sprig at wide intervals, so that when Mrs. Godfrey Cass begged to provide one and asked Eppy to choose what it should be, Previous meditation had enabled her to give a decided answer at once. "'You won't be giving me away today, Father,' Eppie had said before they went to church. "'You'll only be taking Aaron to be a son to you.' Dolly Winthrop walked behind with her husband, and there ended the little bridal procession. The bridal party returned home to the little cottage by the stone pits, for Eppy and Aaron had decided they would rather live there with Silas than go to any new home. Eppy had a larger garden than she had ever expected there now, and in other ways there had been alterations at the expense of Mr. Cass, the landlord, to suit Silas's larger family. The garden was fenced with stones on two sides, but in front there was an open fence, through which the flowers shone with answering gladness as those united people came within sight of them. Oh, father, said Eppy, what a pretty home ours is. I think nobody could be happier than we are. <laughs>